Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. Privileged to be your host, this is Dan Moore. Well, welcome to the Action Catalyst. This is Dan Moore, and I'm so excited that today we're going to be spending time with Don Yeager. Don has had an amazing career. He started as a print journalist, and for our younger listeners, you can look that up online to find out what a print journalist was. Now, print journalism is extremely important in the history of our company and continues to be today, but he's also an inspirational speaker. He's an author himself. He works with people to help them become more successful in their lives. It's amazing the people that he's met and had an impact on and vice versa over the years. He's written books, some of which are in the New York Times bestseller list, and some of the people that he has spent time with and helped create books with are Hall of Fame running back Walter Payton, the great UCLA basketball coach John Wooden, who created the amazing pyramid of success, some baseball legends, John Smoltz and Tug McGraw, and I'm here in Nashville, and Tim McGraw is a local hero here, his son. Football stars Warwick Dunn, Michael Orr. Most people have seen the movie The Blind Side, and he spent time with Michael himself, which is fantastic. But he's also created some amazing books about history. Uh, George Washington's Secret Six, a book about the citizen spy ring that actually helped us win the Revolutionary War, which I knew nothing about before, and I suppose most of us don't. Uh, also a book about Thomas Jefferson and the Tripoli Pilots. Pirates, he's written about Andrew Jackson and the Miracle of New Orleans. So many historical background things, sports things that just really, I think, have, have shaped Don's life. He was an associate, uh, an, an, I'm sorry, associate editor of Sports Illustrated, which I read religiously as a kid. In fact, my parents said, you're going to have to stop reading it in church. You're reading it religiously. <laughs> Terrible joke. But uh, after, so after 30, 30 year career at Sports Illustrated, Don went in to pursue his public speaking career, and he's been able to share stories of inspiration from our generation with audiences from Fortune 10 companies to even cancer survivor groups. And I hope you'll share a bit about your personal story with us there, Don. It would be, I think, meaningful and powerful for people. So his 10th New York Times bestseller teammate was the inspiration behind his newest keynote talk, which is called What Makes a Great Teammate? Becoming Invaluable Without Being Most Valuable. And I sure want to hear more about that. So, Don Yeager, welcome to the Action Catalyst. Ben, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. You've had so many amazing twists and turns in your careers. Um, I say careers because there's been more than one. What would you say have been some of the most significant pivot points that caused you to maybe move from the San Antonio Light, your first stop, to then to Sports Illustrated, and then to get into writing books, all the rest of that? You know, I, I think uh, Dan, one of the things I love about what you're what you're sharing with your audience uh, is this idea that everybody loves to see people who uh, we perceive are successful, right? I mean, there's they've achieved something, and we think it's just this. It's been a, a, a direct line, right? And they've they've, they've there's the, the uh, there've been no bumps in the road. And the truth is, uh, just as there is in your life, and um, I've I've had some incredible. Uh, uh, derailings, right? Places mm -hmm. where my personal behavior, um, uh, I, I mean, I had a, I had a situation in when I was working for a newspaper before I got to Sports Illustrated where I let my ego get out of control. And um, I had written my first book and I was just so dead set to be on every TV show I could be on that uh, I ignored uh, instruction from a, from a, a leader within my my own company and and ultimately lost my job because my ego had gotten out of control and um, and I had to re you know those kinds of moments occur in the uh, in the life cycle of anybody who's ultimately successful the difference I think the thing that I've learned um, is how long do you dwell on the life how long do you let a moment like that uh, take you from uh, your path. I um, I learned early, uh, both as an athlete and as a um, as someone who studied athletes, uh, that the the truly best kind of have a twenty four hour rule. And this became my this became a model for me 
um, from even the time period I was in high school. Anything that was that, that, that bad, that had affected me negatively, I gave myself 24 hours um, to wallow and to, uh, to, to find pity and, uh, and, and to blame others. And then at the end of 24 hours, and I would watch the clock. Trust me, because I, I want to make sure I got every bit of my 24 hours. <laughs> uh, I, um, I knew that mentally, uh, physically, emotionally, I had to shift and begin thinking, okay, that's, that's the past. Um, in, the, in the parlance of basketball, we, we use the phrase next play, right? What's the next play? What's the, you know, um, what? And, and you have to ask yourself that uh, really often. Even if the last play was a good play, you have to look at yourself and say, next play. And, um, and so I had a 24-hour rule. And whenever something um, uh, took me off task, whenever something really uh, hurt uh, me professionally, obviously there were some personal moments that lasted longer, but um, I let myself wallow mm -hmm. for a short period. And then, uh, and then when the clock hit 24 hours, and I was very intentional about that, I would, um, uh, I would immediately begin the process of saying, okay, now how do I talk to myself differently? How do I make sure I'm saying uh, what's the next play and what do I have to do to set the next play up? Um, and in all of those situations, even out of the very worst that happened to me, better things came. Uh, and I think that that's a, that's a, um, I, I don't think I, there's, there's nothing uncommon about what happened to me there other than that I learned how to go next play because most people I've talked to who reframe their mind that way, find that kind of, um, success continues on afterward. Mm. I love that phrase, reframe your mind. Yes. Because we all know that it's easy to stay in that wallow mode. We, we yep. might get to the 24th hour and then say, well, how about just another hour? This is really awesome. Yeah, this is, I'm really <laughs> enjoying this. I mean, this pain is so awesome. Let's just, <laughs> let's just continue one more hour. No, I think it's, um, I think that, uh, that 24 hour rule became a really important part of my, um, uh, my development from, again, from the time I was in high school. Um, I, I, my father, uh, was an ama a man of amazing wisdom. He was a Methodist preacher. And uh, a guy who just, um, I didn't realize how wise he was, obviously, like most parents. Um, but he used to talk to me about that all the time. You know, you can there, the, control the things you can control. And, um, uh, and I knew that how I talked to myself was one of the ways I was, one of the things I could control. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Do you mind, uh, Don, expanding a bit on that, how you talk to yourself in the context of these amazing performers and business, literature, and sports that you've spent so much time with, what, what about self-talk? Do you, do you see that's a common practice that, the where they're very intentional about making it constructive and positive instead of just a random floating of thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the great lessons that was taught to me was by a, um, a women's soccer coach at the University of Florida. Uh, won a national championship, really, really successful. But one of the things she talked to me about was how she regularly worked with her players on, you know, um, something's gone wrong. Uh, yeah, penalty has occurred. Uh, uh, you've just given up an important goal, whatever it is. What would you walk over and say to your teammate if they had, if that had happened to them, right? Mm. You'd throw your arm around them. You would be encouraging. You would be next play, right? We're going to, we have to put that behind us. We have to, you know, that's not, this isn't your fault, right? We would say all of those things to our teammate, right? But, but when it's us, we, we go the complete opposite direction and we beat ourselves up. Oh my gosh, this team would be so much better if I had not shown up today, right? What if I had just not, um, not been, uh, what if I hadn't, uh, uh, you know, made it to the team bus? Imagine that goal would probably not have gone in. You blame yourself in ways that you would never blame your teammate. And so she started saying to them, every time you get into a situation where you begin to talk to yourself, put it in third person, imagine it's you talking to a teammate, because the way we talk to others is always more positive 
than the way we talk to ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so by, by telling yourself, you know, I'm going to, I, I now need to look at myself in the third person. I need to be able to talk to myself like I would talk to others. Um, you find yourself um, uh, able to, to say the words that you really need to hear, which is, you know, that was an unfortunate moment. And, uh, and let's, let's move on. I'd say there's a reason she was a national championship coach. Without question. Right. Yeah, she's one, one of the single most inspirational women I've ever met. That's fantastic. I, I, re- I read a similar quote the other day that said, if someone else talked to you the way you talk to yourself, you'd leave that person. Oh, man, that's powerful. <laughs> that's a great line. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, very reflective of what you just shared. Yeah. If, if we can, can jump ahead to, to your own personal crisis that you dealt with, with, with your health, um, Donna, you've alluded to that and how you work with cancer survivors and work with them. Can you share a bit about that for us, please? Yeah. Um, so I was 40 years old and um, I uh, loved the game of basketball. I played all the time. I have a full court at my house. I love the game of basketball. It is my way of continuing to try to act act young and, uh, and, and still play with younger people. And, um, uh, and I, I, I did the really dumb thing that you shouldn't do and pick up basketball. And I stepped in to take an offensive foul. And, uh, the young man that was coming down the lane hit me with an elbow and crushed my nose, just flattened it. I mean, so uh, badly that, that surgery was scheduled for the next day to rebuild my face. And, um, they obviously didn't do that good a job. <laughs> but, um, but in the process of that, uh, they did uh, x-rays. And, um, and the x-ray was supposed to have ended at my chin, but it actually, for whatever reason, it slipped down a little bit. And the doctor came in and said, by the way, we just, we, in our x-rays, we noticed a little something down here uh, that we are not sure of. And we're going to, um, while we have you under, we're going to check it out. And uh, I woke up. They they worked on my face, and um, but they allowed me to. They they shared with me that uh, that the biopsy had come back that I had stage three uh, thyroid cancer, and uh, it had already spread through the lymph nodes of my body, and I had no idea because I was young and healthy, and you know I, I I didn't have a reason to have been checked for that previously, and I mm-hmm. had no idea. It was a total accident, right? Although, if you believe as I believe, you would say it was a God thing, right? And, um, uh, and so, uh, two days later I was back in the surgical center and they were, um, uh, they were, they they were doing, um, surgery to to remove what they could of the cancer and the cancerous area. And I entered into a treatment protocol, um, uh, that, that landed me at the end uh, for three days in a lead walled room, uh, with no human contact because they had they were running so much radiation through me. I was uh, radioactive. And, wow. Um, I'd never been alone for three days in my life. And uh, I used those three days to really kind of sit down and do a lot of evaluation in life. And it's a shame that it took cancer to make me take three days to do that. Right. And that's, I guess, if there's a great lesson in it, it would be don't make cancer uh, set your set as- require you to set aside time to evaluate yourself. Right. Right. And, um, I realized that a, that a dream of mine had always been to be a father and I had not, I'd missed on, you know, opportunities and things. And I just said it wasn't going to, I wasn't going to miss again. And uh, a couple of years later, met the woman I would marry. Um, uh, by the time I was 45, I was a dad for the first time. 46, I was a dad for the second time. Awesome. And here I am. Here I am, uh, you know, 10 years later with a 10 year old and nine year old. And, uh, it's pretty awesome. So cancer changed my life, but in many ways, um, and out in every way for the better. That is incredible. And what an insight, you know, don't wait until you're in a lead lined room to take the time to evaluate and assess and really think through what it is you want most. Yeah. Cause that's a pretty crappy place to do it by the way. Well, particularly with the uncertainty, there's no right. guarantee, no guarantee the radiation is going to work. If it had, met, if it was metastatic cancer in your lymph nodes, no telling where it was going. Yep. So, uh, wow. and now we're 
we're sitting here now 11 years or we're sitting here now uh whatever it is 13 years cancer free so it's pretty awesome well i willingly say praise god that's fantastic yeah thank you wow so without even really wanting to you have been forced to learn a lot of lessons about what to do when you hit that unforeseen brick wall um, yes sir uh, what what have been some you've talked about some the 24-hour rule you've talked about intentionally changing your thoughts um what what else has kind of helped you don when a door suddenly closed that you thought was going to be wide open well i i, I i'm i'm a um for whatever reason i am uh i'm just crazy positive right i i, I believe uh, that um uh, that if a door closes, that a, that, a, that a better door is destined for me. I just don't know what it will be. And um, I think the one thing, you know, I've, I've shared with people, faith is uh, an important piece of who I am. I think it's come up a couple times here already. But I think that the, the real value in faith isn't just my personal relationship. It's the mindset that says there have to be things out there you won't understand um, at the moment. Uh, and you have to believe it's going to be okay, right? They, 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 these things make no sense to me, um, and yet I have to be okay with them. And that's a that's a real challenging place. So I, I think that that role um, in my life has been important to me. It's it's played a role in my being willing and and uh, able and open um, to uh, accept uh, tough times. And and again, it, the other thing too is it's there have been some really good times since uh, that that I've had to learn how to how to keep in in uh, perspective as well. Um, moments when you're going, this is crazy. Like who? I mean, if you'd have told me when I was a young journalist that I would get a chance to write a book, one book, that'd have been awesome, right? Book number twenty eight comes out here shortly. If you'd have told me a few people would have bought one of my books, that'd have been incredible. And uh, as you referenced, I mean, 11 New York Times bestsellers, it's fewer than 30 writers in the history of the New York Times list in the nonfiction category have ever gotten that. And it's just their, their numbers. I, I've been blessed beyond measure. And that's the way I see it all the time. It's these are blessings. Wow. I think that's absolutely incredible. Uh, now, as you've spent time with, with some of these iconic sports figures and, and amazing people, it's so easy to look at them with their their monetary success, their fame, their fan clubs, all their likes on Facebook. But I know many of them also have faced immense difficulties. Can you share one or two stories of, of maybe inspiration from that are lesser known, you know, from some of these amazing figures that you've spent time with that have maybe, I guess, particularly impacted you? Sure, I would say um, uh, one of them. Uh, I'm going to show you the story of a, of a NFL running back named Warwick Dunn, who probably very few people in your uh, in your audience might even know by name. Um, uh, I, I actually did a. Uh, I just we just released our first ever virtual learning program, and he's a key element in in a session we do on how to manage adversity because that's what you do, right? If you're developing yourself, that's a that's a hallmark here. But Warwick was a um, uh, Warwick was uh, a high school phenom running back, very very small, five seven, 178 pounds, um, and he's playing in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and his mother is a police officer, and um, uh, in a robbery at a bank, she's shot and killed, mm -hmm. and uh, he's 18 years old, and he's the oldest of six, no father in the household, he's the man. Uh, he goes to college, brings his youngest brothers and sisters with him, puts them through elementary and middle school, um, becomes the all-time leading rusher in the history of Florida State University, and becomes a first-round draft pick in the NFL. Uh, the 12th pick of the entire NFL draft. And when he's there, uh, he walks into Coach Tony Dungy's office, and he said, I want to start a charity. And he begins a charity buying homes for women like his mother, single moms. As a rookie in the NFL, he just bought his 168th home for a mom um, wow. just, uh, just a few weeks, a couple of weeks. Actually, I was in the Atlanta airport with him a couple of weeks ago as he was heading to give that home away to a single mom in Baton Rouge. 168 homes. 
But in the process of that, he, he goes into the NFL, um, becomes the smallest player in history to rush for 10,000 yards. And at the end of, uh, as his career is coming to a close, he wins the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award, the greatest honor they give to a player for off the field behavior. And he, his winning that award made a publisher realize how great his story was, offered him the chance to tell, tell it in a book, and he asked me to be the writer. So the two of us are writing his book, and it, and it ends, uh, as we're getting toward the close, um, I ask him a question. If you were to get a chance to go eye to eye with the man that killed your mom, um, what would you say to him today? You know, what, would you, what kind of questions would you ask him? And, uh, and ultimately, that conversation led he and I to death row six months later in Louisiana, where we sat down in a small cell with the man that killed his mom. Oh, my God. It's the most amazing hour I've ever spent in my life. And we get, we get toward the end of that hour, and Warwick looks at the man, and he says, I don't know why you came here today, but I came here today to forgive you. Hmm. Most hmm. amazing thing I've ever watched. I mean, you know, we can watch all the Super Bowls in the world, right? We can see incredible uh, feats day after day, and it became this real amazing moment because Warwick was telling me as we left the prison, he said, I, you know, my mother used to tell me that in moments of challenge and moments of adversity, you get two choices. You can be bitter or you can be better. And as my child, I ask you to always choose better. Mm -hmm. And when he said he was looking at that inmate that day, and he wanted to make his mother proud. Mm -hmm. And I think, wow. You know what? I mean, there's, there's the greatest lesson of all. Right? Adversity's promised all of us. Bitter or better. Make your choice. And um, uh, the, most amazing, the most amazing champions pick better. What an incredible story, Don. And uh, work done. And what an example to the world, particularly the world today, where we're so quick to take offense, where we're so quick to carry grudges, where we're so quick to seek revenge. Yeah. And I know uh, this, uh, this podcast is going to run in a few weeks, but, but um, many people, by the time they see this, will have remembered that the Super Bowl was played in Atlanta right, mm -hmm. this year. Um, you should know that as Warwick was coming to the end of his career, uh, he played several years for the Atlanta Falcons. And uh, the owner of the Falcons, Arthur Blank, uh, realized what an extraordinary human Warwick was, and that he just set a really great example for all those who play the game today. And so he invited Warwick and arranged for him to become a part, the first ever African American part owner of the Atlanta Falcons. Of the Atlanta Falcons. Wow. So when, when the uh, Super Bowl trophy is handed out, um, Warwick will be standing right there with the trophy as a part owner of the host team of the Falcons. Pretty cool. That is more than cool and and the fact that he had the trust in you to actually act on that thought if you could confront the person that killed your mother what would you say and then months later there you were together yeah. don how do you how do you build how do you build trust you know these amazing people these athletes in particular are being pitched from 360 degrees on all kinds of things and gaining trust from somebody that is naturally skeptical just for self-preservation, what, what, how in the world do you do that? What are your ideas there? That's a really great question. I think it comes down to um, uh, trying to be authentic with them, right? Uh, just let them, um, you know. Uh, and, and also, I don't ever try to, I know a lot of people that try to, equate themselves with others as, as a way of developing um, uh, camaraderie, as a way of developing connection. Like, oh yeah, yeah, I mean, I know you ran for all, but let me tell you what I've done in my life, right? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't ever try to equate um, my story um, to the story of anybody I get a chance to work with because they're not. I mean, I, I look at myself as blessed to be um, able to help others tell their story. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think of my story as equivalent in any way. And I think that that works to my advantage because I don't, um, I'm not busy trying to, every time they tell a story, come up with a story that will give me, um, and we've, we've all been in conversations with those people, right? Who every time you share something, they've got to one up you with something else. And I think that's where a lot of people get, get skeptical of others. If you just say, you know what, man, I am so grateful that I get a chance to learn from you. Thank you. Wow. Humility and gratitude. Those just come off. You. Even if I weren't seeing your face, I'd feel it in your tone and I'd feel it in your heart. It's fantastic. Well, it, um, it allows, I, I think it allows a lot of really um, raw conversations to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think people are, um, and I think that's really, uh, that's where the good stuff comes from. Right. At the same time, you have tremendously positive self-esteem, the, the sense that you can make a difference in the world. And I think that probably empowers you. Would you agree that you like yourself quite a bit too? I do. I, I you know, I mean, there, there are lots of things I wish I did better, but I don't, uh, I don't beat myself up often. I'm, I remind myself uh, daily. I said, I used the word blessed earlier. I, re I remind myself daily uh, that I'm blessed with, um, opportunities and I don't always think of them as opportunities to affect others as much as I think, uh, as I'm, I'm a, um, a reflector, right? I get to learn things and I'm inquisitive by nature. So if I'm driven to ask the right questions and draw from you the best answers, incredible answers, then my real job is to take those answers and reflect them off to other people. If I do it right, you're right. Other people are affected positively. Um, but I think of myself mostly as just, I'm, I'm really selfishly, I'm kind of in it for me, right? I want to learn from you in a way that's really good for me. And then if I do it well and I share it well, others benefit as well. It's like a ringside seat that you get a chance to learn from some great people. That's it. I, I, I don't play the game. I just sit, I, but I, but hopefully I'm close enough, uh, to the people that I can, uh, I can share what they're thinking. Right. Um, to me, Don, you practice the best definition of humility I've ever heard. And that's when somebody way smarter than me said that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. Yeah. John Wooden said that. Yeah. Well, he's a great man. Many people. Yeah. He was an amazing gift in my life. Uh, when I was 14, I had a chance to go to six games at Pauley Pavilion when my dad was on faculty at UCLA. It was a tremendous experience. Wow. He, um, yeah, I had, uh, I, and I, I don't know how we're doing on time, but if I could tell you one quick John Wooden story. Absolutely, was, you can. So coach, um, I was working for Sports Illustrated uh, at the time, and, uh, and I'd heard a story that uh, Shaquille O'Neal, who was, uh, you know, the hip-hop star, the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, the center, they was doing bad movies and worse rap songs, um, he was all of those things, but he, but I heard that on a monthly basis, he was going out to spend an afternoon with John Wooden. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty credible. Like coach was 88 at the time. Shaq was 26. What could the two of them other than basketball have in common? And so, uh, through Shaq's college coach, Dale Brown, um, who's a great friend, I reached out and, sh and I got an invitation to join them for one of these little afternoons. Oh my goodness. And, um, and Shaq said, now these are mentoring sessions. Right. This is where I, this is where I go to grow. Right. And I thought, how cool is that? 26 year old kid, you know, wanting to go to grow with an 88 year old legend and sitting there, I was, I, I was blown away. Like these two didn't talk basketball. They talked, uh, about being a better father, about being a better teammate uh you know and it was just really good good and we got up at the end and i i looked at coach wooden who i knew just a little bit i mean i've met him a few times and i said coach you're one of the most extraordinary men on the planet you know and he all shucks it i said how does someone get mentored by you pretty cool mm -hmm. right? and he looked at me and he said you ask <laughs> you asked. And I, said, and I said, how many people ask? 
And he said, not as many as you might think. So most people walk themselves right out of the opportunity before they ever ask. They've got a reason why you'd never be their mentor, right? A reason why you'll never engage them in conversation. And so they never ask. Powerful lesson. I go back, I write my story. I reach back to coach. And, um, and as we're talking, I said, coach, something told me as I was standing there, I was supposed to ask. And he said, Don, what took you so long? <laughs> and the next month we scheduled a day where I flew to California to spend that day with John Wood, just learning from him at his feet. Um, and as a result of that, every other month for 12 years, I flew to California for a day with Coach Wooden. I have I just hundreds of hours of time sitting in his presence, soaking it up, learning from him. But my job was to come with a game plan every time I was there. Like I had to have my questions because he was willing to give me whatever time I needed. But the second I ran out of questions, the session was over. Mm -hmm. You might imagine the pressure that put on me to be well prepared and have great questions and and he just, but I, but it started because I asked and that was a really big moment for me. And the lesson that I think I offer people, especially younger folks who are talking about what I want to be. Well, the first thing you do is reach out and ask, you know, and uh, amazing things happen. Wow. I think it has something to do with um, knock, seek, ask. There's a few verses about that. Yes. It's amazing. Um, Don, how, how do you personally avoid what might be called the natural tendency to, to slack off, to coast, to become complacent? You know, you, you've achieved so much and you could sit back and simply literally rest on your laurels. Whatever laurels are, you could rest on them. But mm -hmm. something is keeping you growing and keeping you contributing, keeping you moving. What, what can you share about that in terms of your own inner motivations? You know, um, one piece of it is, uh, um, uh, it, you know, this one, this one's kind of an odd one, but we, I've actually dealt with this one, right? This is, this is the therapy moment, right? Okay. Um, where I, uh, I realized that, um, I'm, I'm driven really hard, like, and I drive myself really hard and, um, and my wife and others have asked me like, why do you do this? So, you know, you're, you're now 56, right? You don't have to do this. And, as hard as you do and um uh and and working through it you know my father uh left the ministry at one stage and actually went to work for a company and um while we were living in hawaii which is where i was born and raised uh he lost his job and was unemployed for uh, almost nine months and i watched my dad you know i watched i watched the the you know the the uh, cabinets at our house go empty and I watched my father put on his suit every morning going and looking for work. And it scared me as a little kid. Right. And I, uh, uh, and even to this day, so I like, I don't, I don't have any clue. My wife says all the time, it's really funny to her. I have no clue how much money is in our bank account because I don't care. Right. That's not what drives me. What drives me almost as much as anything is the fear of an empty counter with my kids, right? A, an empty cabinet with my kids. And so I'm, I, I, I guess you could say part of my drive is um, based on a life experience that was not altogether positive, right? But was, um, but, uh, but left a mark, um, a, a mark that I hope I use properly today. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I don't, I hope it's not overly negative. Um, and then the second thing is I just, I'm an uh, insatiable learner. I, I wake up, uh, I, I, I go to sleep every night and uh, as I close my eyes, I ask myself, I, I say a prayer and which I do every night. And I also ask myself, what did I learn today yeah. uh, that I'll use tomorrow? And I try to mark, I try to make myself, a, I try to, I try to think through what did I learn today that I'll use tomorrow? And um, I can't answer that question, man. I, I may not sleep tonight. Uh, <laughs> But I, um, I, because I love learning so much, I hopefully always can. Right. Well, clearly you do love learning and clearly you always will continue to learn. What's most beneficial to me personally and to our audience is that you're willing to share of what you've learned. That's fantastic. Um, as we unfortunately have to start wrapping up, what would you say to somebody that is just out of aces? You know, they are 
so discouraged. They are, are it could be work related, it could be family related, it could be a bad news health report. Um, any, any general thoughts there? Because we have people on this uh, call that are, are, are experiencing that now or know people that are. Yeah, I think um, a big piece of it again is, uh, we've referred to it a couple times, but talking to yourself, right? Mm. Uh, it's about what do you, what do you um, first off, it's, it's about feeding yourself. I would argue that, that, you know, in moments like that, go look for, um, go look for some level of inspiration, whether it's in um, a podcast or in a book uh, or in, um, uh, you know, a, a virtual course or something, someplace where you can go learn, you know, someplace where you can go uh, take your mind from what's, what seems to be swallowing you right now and, and hopefully begin the conversation and start changing the conversation. And there, because if left alone, we will continue to feed the beast. Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you have to be very intentional about going and, uh, and creating a different meal plan. Right. And so, um, I guess what I would say to them is, uh, stop, you know, take a minute to try to figure out where can I go? What can I do that will, um, that can help me, um, see things differently, right? Is there someone else that's had a similar experience who's written a book or has been on a, on a podcast or has some kind of, um, work on their website that I can go read and listen to. Um, but, but there's a role model out there for all of us, right? There's a mentor out there for all of us. And they don't always have to be people we meet. It could be places we can go to learn. And um, so I would, I would start there. And I think that if you begin that process, um, you also help put some of what you're going through in perspective, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I hate to say that idea of, go look for someone that's got it worse than you and then it helps you get, it helps you put it in perspective. But the truth is that there are, there are times we need to realize that what we're struggling with, uh, can, in, can in many places be seen as first world problems. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and our ability to kind of help put everything in perspective, uh, allows us to step back a little easier and, um, and pull ourselves out. Right there's the true shadow we face and then there's the shadow we inflate beyond what is reasonable. Right. Yeah. There's the one that happens because that halo light that's above you right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm just joking, but I love that light, man. I got to tell you, 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 uh, you look really good. Took ages to get it there. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it's my forehead reflecting. <laughs> <laughs> He's just an Amanda. It took Amanda to get it there. There you so. go. Well, Don, thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared and more importantly for the person that you are, the life that you lead, the family that you have, and the wisdom that you've offered to all of us. We are so grateful for you. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. Absolutely. Enjoy the day. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening. This episode is sponsored by Southwestern Coaching. Southwestern Coaching has helped over 12,000 people increase their incomes by over 25% on average. As a successful salesperson, you know the importance of increasing your sales, but sometimes you might just need a little extra push and accountability to meet your goals and grow your business. Southwestern Coaching will help you increase your income through one-on-one -on -one sales and leadership coaching tailored specifically to your needs. Together, we will elevate sales. To schedule your free one-on-one -on -one business action planning session with a Southwestern Coach, Go to www.southwesternconsulting.com forward slash action catalyst.